Hello again. In this video, we'll talk about 2D curves and B splines. Last time, we introduced Catmull ROM splines, which have C1 continuity, and natural cubic splines, which have C2 but lack local control. Today, we'll introduce B splines, which are both C2 and have local control, but don't interpolate most control points. Remember in part one, we saw how you can manipulate a curve by its tangent. This works pretty well except when the interval of the curve is between zero and one, which is pretty common. Then the tangents get very long. So instead, let's introduce additional control points one third of the way along the tangents, and we'll invert the second one so it's closer to the curve itself. This gives us a new way to express cubics called a Bezier curve, and it's got some really nice properties. For example, the curve is contained in the convex hull of the control points. This gives a bound on its shape. A second advantage is that the equation can be written directly in terms of the control point positions. Notice there's no coefficients a, b, c, and d to solve for here. That's pretty cool. A third advantage is that Bezier's help us create b splines. This is a b spline. You'll notice it doesn't interpolate any of its control points. Maybe that's why it looks unhappy. Here's how b splines work. You take each line between consecutive control points and divide it into thirds. Then connect these points together and divide them into two equal parts. Then place Bezier control points at these four locations. That's it. You're probably wondering, why go through all this trouble just to put down a Bezier curve? Well, because now if we add another control point, it adds a second curve segment automatically. And check out how smooth this curve is. It has C2 continuity. How does it achieve that? Let's call the first cubic segment F and the second G. Let's look at the knot where the two curves meet. The knot exactly bisects the line between the adjacent two control points. And this means that the two derivatives are equal. There's a similar argument for why the second derivatives are also equal at the knot. This very clever construction guarantees a C2 spline. B splines are cool because they're both C2 and have local control. When I drag this control point, only one part of the spline moves. Great, so we've covered three types of splines which have different features depending on what you want. For example, if you need to interpolate the control points with local control, Catmull ROM is the way to go. On the other hand, if you want C2 and local control, then B splines are a good choice. Okay, but suppose our bug wants to fly on this path. Well, there's one problem. This isn't a proper function. You can see it has two different f values for the same value of t. We've been treating curves as 1D functions, but they really live in 2D. Every point in the curve has an x and a y component. In fact, both coordinates are functions of t. So x of t and y of t are two different spline curves. Here's what the spline looks like for our bug path, the x-spline. And here's the y-spline. And when you put these two together, you get our bug path on top. So that sounds tricky, but creating 2D spline curves is actually very easy. Each control point corresponds to a different point in time. Let's start with the first one. This control point defines two different constraints. X is zero at time t equals zero, and Y is two. These two constraints define control points for our X and Y splines. Now the second control point is at t equals four, and it defines control points for the x and y splines in the same way. And similarly for t equals six and t equals 10 control points. Now we just go ahead and fit one spline to x and another to y, and just plot these together to give us the top curve. Cool. These splines are all synchronized, so you can watch them advance together. Now one big advantage of representing splines separately in X and Y is that you can control timing better. Suppose that we want our bug to fly faster for the last segment. Going back to our control points, let's just change t equals 10 to a smaller number. Now the bug has to fly the last leg in only a quarter of the time as before. When we make this change, the corresponding control points for the X and Y curves slide over. Here's our new spline.
you can see the bug really speeds up at the end. Notice the shape of this curve is different compared to the one before. The bug is backing up to allow it to pick up speed for the final leg. This is like how you give yourself a longer runway to reach your maximum speed before a jump. How does the spline know how to do this? How does it know about physics? Well, this is the magic of natural cubic splines. Recall that a natural cubic spline minimizes the square of the second derivative over time. We can write this as acceleration. This is the same acceleration from Newton's second law, which is proportional to force. So the spline is minimizing the amount of force expended over time. Basically, the bug doesn't have to flap its wings as hard to accelerate this way. And there you have it, bug physics. I hope you've enjoyed these videos on splines.